obtain their fund requirements. So there are different ways of uh, issuing the shares and debentures, which can be broadly classified into two categories. Either there is a public issue or there is a private issue. Either there is a public issue or there is a private issue. So what happens uh, in case of uh, public issue is the shares are issued by the company to the uh, shareholders who is the general public. So when we say public, it comprises of uh, three categories of uh, investors. One is people like me and you who are generally referred to as retail investor in stock market language. And then the second category of investors are called high net worth individuals. So depending on the amount what uh, we are investing, either we are classified as high net worth individuals or we are classified as retail investors. And the third category of investors includes institutional investors, which are primarily institutions and organizations investing in the company's shares. So this is the three classification. So when we say public, this is what the so-called public comprises of investors, which includes either individuals or institutions. So when a company plans to borrow funds from public, it can either issue shares to public. Option number two, not all the companies prefer to issue shares to public. Uh, because one of the drawback of public issue is that you lose control. Meaning to say the more number of shares you issue to public, that means you're dilute, diluting uh, control in your own organization. So most of the companies have this tendency of issuing shares to an extent that it does not dilute uh, their control. So at least 51% the promoters should have. If the promoters do not have at least 51%, then they will lose control in their own company. So a, an alternative to public issue is called private placement. So in private placement, what happened? The shares are not issued to public, but rather the issuing company, which is in need of capital, enters into an agreement with only few institutions. And those few institutions agree to fund the capital requirements of the company in return for shares. So in simple words, instead of shares being issued to public, the shares are rather issued to few entities, to few enterprises, to few institutions. So this becomes a private placement. And private placement is relatively much economical uh, when compared to public issue because here the formalities are quite uh, less in comparison with public issue. So these are the ways through which companies borrow funds, right? Companies borrow funds by offering their shares either to public or going for a private placement. So when a company does this for the first time, it is called initial public offer. But in case if the company has already done this in the past, then it becomes follow on public offer. So in uh, pub public issue, you either have uh, IPO or you either have an FPO, initial public offer or follow on public offer. Now we shall uh, look into the procedure of issuing shares, which has certain uh, legal uh, protocols that needs to be followed. And one of them is to appoint a merchant banker. So what this means is that the companies cannot on their own do all the necessary steps which are uh, part of the issue mechanism. Issue mechanism is basically the process of issuing shares and procuring the funds, but rather the company has to take the help of an institution called merchant bankers. Right. So don't be under the assumption that merchant bankers are individuals. Merchant bankers are not individuals. Merchant bankers are financial institutions. They are either banking institutions or sometimes they are non-banking institutions. 
So most of the banks in India also do have license for merchant banking. Uh, so different uh, category of banking requires a different uh, set of licensing uh, protocols, which needs to be obtained from the Reserve Bank of India. So if you're into retail banking, that requires a separate license. If you are venturing into merchant banking, merchant banking also has different licensing requirement and certain uh, legal conditions set by either Securities Exchange Board of India or the Reserve Bank. So most of the banks in India also do merchant banking business. So you have to appoint a merchant banker who will indeed take up the issue mechanism on your behalf. Merchant bankers remind me of the uh, wedding planners, which have become quite popular these days. So what do wedding planners do? They do everything, right? Right from uh, hunting a bride or a groom and right from sending you people to honeymoon, right? So that's the end of the uh, wedding planners, right? So this is what merchant bankers also do. They undertake all the tasks and uh, activities which are part of the issue mechanism. The moment you appoint merchant bankers, most of your work is done. As a company, all the procedure would be taken care by the merchant bankers. So that's the first step. So we will discuss a little more about merchant bankers uh, after we have a few minutes when we discuss their roles and responsibilities. So what these merchant bankers will do is the moment you give them the contract of issue mechanism, they will see that whether to borrow funds from the public or through private placement, do you meet the necessary conditions which are drafted by SEBI? So this is the entry norms. This are the entry norms which needs to be complied with. So your merchant banker will tell you whether you fulfill this entry norms. In case if you do not fulfill all the entry norms, what is the alternative route to obtain funds from the public? So compliance uh, is carried out by the merchant banker. So he does the uh, compliance test for your organization. And in case if things go well, you meet the prerequisites set by the regulator, Securities Exchange Board of India, then the next step is like preparing the wedding invitation. So here in case the merchant banker prepares a prospectus, which is an invitation come information brochure, which has comprehensive information about the company's past performance, present situation and future prospects. So this so-called prospect becomes a guiding book because prospects will help investor to decide to understand the company, right? And uh, the information will help the investor ultimately to decide whether to subscribe for the shares or to reject because this information booklet has all the disclosures, A to Z information about the company, which is prepared as per the uh, guidelines of the SEBI. And this prospect is again prepared with the help of merchant bankers. So company will supply the information and merchant bankers will draft the prospectus. So generally uh, what happens is people like me and you, uh, we don't have the time to go through the prospectus, which runs in hundreds of pages. Sometimes the prospect runs in 600, 700 pages. And it becomes quite challenging us for to read all that. So we go by the reports or the reviews given by the uh, brokering houses. So brokering firm they do uh, evaluation and examination of the information given in the prospects so by reviewing the data the info given in the prospects they give their advice whether to subscribe whether to avoid or sometimes they are quite neutral in their opinion so we can follow the advice of the brokerage firms instead of going through the entire prospectus but it's better to study the prospectus uh, because it's always better to do it yourself instead of following somebody's advice, sometimes there is an element of uh, a conflict of interest which is involved in such uh, reviews, right? So sometimes we don't know how genuine these reviews and opinions given by the stockbroking houses. Sometimes they are also influenced by the companies. So, well, that's the, uh, that's about the prospectus.
Next comes the appointment of underwriters who play an instrumental role in case if the shares are undersubscribed. Then we also have appointment of bankers who are responsible for collecting money from the investors or responsible for collecting the share application from the investor. So you have to appoint and communicate to the investors who are your bankers. Brokers to the issue also play an important role. Then we also have the uh, registrar to issue who is responsible for maintaining all the records uh, which gets generated during the entire process of issue mechanism. Then comes filing of documents and after this you have the price discovery. You have to decide the share price and this share price needs to be communicated to the uh, investors. So investors will do an evaluation to see whether the price what you have quoted for the shares whether it is undervalued or overvalued or whether it is rightly priced. So price, price play an important role in the uh, subscription. And then comes the allotment of shares and the concluding step is the listing. So listing is when your shares are officially traded on recognized stock market. So here in the step number 11, it is the end of the primary market. So from step number 11 onwards, now the process is taken over by the stock market. So primary markets is only from step one to step, step 10. So these are part of the primary market. So once the shares are listed, primary market gets concluded. So let's uh, evaluate these steps uh, one by one. Uh, the first step is, of course, the appointment of a merchant banker. So what kind of tasks do merchant bankers perform? What are their roles and responsibilities in the entire issue mechanism? Uh, merchant bankers are also known as the lead managers. And they are the in charge of the entire issue process, entire issue process. So who are these merchant bankers? Merchant bankers are independent financial institutions appointed by the companies uh, for raising the funds from the public. So basically they are the facilitators who help companies in procuring the funds from the either through public issue or it can be through private placement. So they do the entire compliance and help the organization in obtaining necessary funds. That's what merchant bankers do. So merchant bankers responsibilities are uh, uh, broadly classified into uh, two categories. One is the three issue responsibilities. Then of course they also have uh, post issue responsibilities. So we shall discuss this uh, pre issue and uh, post issue responsibilities <clears throat> one by one. So what are the uh, pre issue responsibilities of a merchant banker? So what do merchant bankers do uh, before the shares are publicly uh, traded? So one of the important uh, tasks which merchant bankers have to perform is the task of discovering the price of the share. So price discovery. So who decides the share price, right? Uh, recently we had a couple of uh, IPOs uh, and uh, the IPO which was in the news was Burger King, uh, whose share price was uh, initially decided at 60 rupees. So how do you, how do companies come to conclusion that their share price is worth 60 rupees? How do companies come to a conclusion that the share price is worth 1000 rupees? So how do they discover this price? So price discovery is one of the challenging uh, tasks which the merchant bankers have to undertake. And in order to do price discovery, what is required is due diligence. What merchant bankers do, they carry out a process of due diligence and through the process of due diligence, they discover the price, which means they are trying to say, that okay, we have done all the assessments, we have done all the necessary evaluations, and we have come to a conclusion that the price of your company share is worth only 80 rupees. And then they have to also justify as to why they have come to that particular price point. So what do merchant bankers do as a part of this uh, due diligence process? I would say it's a basically a evaluation which 
all all this required in this evaluation is common sense something which you and me can also do right if if i ask you to decide the uh, fee let's say we are starting a, a new program in our institution uh, similar to an mba program we are doing some more specialization and if i give you a task of deciding the price for an of our mba program on what basis would you come to a conclusion that our price for the mba program should be 1 lakh or 2 lakhs or that matter 50000 on what basis do you decide this so there are various factors that goes into this uh, price discovery so generally when merchant bankers are doing uh, price discovery uh, they study uh, two broader parameters which can be classified as uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative parameters also known as financial and non financial analysis so these financial and non financial analysis or quantitative and qualitative analysis would help them to come to a conclusion as to what should be the share price now as a part of qualitative analysis what uh, merchant bankers do is they study the business model of the organization which means they are trying to understand what is the way in which the company generates revenue how the revenue generation happens from where does the cash inflows and outflows move so they are trying to understand the business model right so what exactly you mean by a business model in simple words it's the means through which you earn your revenues it's a means through which you generate the cash flows right so if uh, to give you an example let me quote a uh, franchise system now you know how franchise system works if you are if you want to undertake a franchise form of business model there is hardly any investment in the initial stage of the business you might have to invest a lot of money but once your business is well established then you can develop a franchise model wherein you don't have to invest all you have to do is you have to uh, allow others to use your business model which we generally say franchise agreement or franchise uh, license form of franchise agreements but first you have to develop a business model and your business model should be tried and tested it should be a successful business model only then you can develop a franchise based business model right and all the major restaurants right which uh, originates from both india and outside india especially the uh, quick format restaurants they work on franchise model so whether it is dominos whether it is burger king whether it is mcdonalds whether it is taco bell whether it is subway whether it is costa cafe whether it is cafe coffee whether it is starbucks whether it is barista whether it is kfc they all work on franchise model which means there is a specific uh, licensing format which needs to be followed so this is a very cost effective model because as the owner of this business model i don't have to invest any money all i have to do is i have to give permission for others to use my business model and through this you generate a lot of revenue so every business has a certain model you know what is the model for model followed by ola and uber do they own the taxis the answer is they know they don't own any assets all the cabs are not owned by ola and uber which is actually a very good model because the moment you start owning the asset it becomes a severe headache because you will pile up the inventory and in case if this inventory is not getting converted into cash you will have serious reper repercussions right and that is what happened to all your uh, a uh, bike uh, sharing uh, uh, startups right they had serious problem during the uh, lockdown whether it is your vogo or whether it is your bounds they had serious problems because they own the assets they own the bikes whereas in case of uber and ola they are just a market aggregator they just give you business and you become their business partner so which model seems to be more financially viable the answer is the uber ola model seems to be more financially viable than the business model followed by uh, vogo and bounds so if i am an investor i'll be little skeptical to invest in the business models of vogo and uh, bounds but i would be more convinced to invest in the business model of ola and uber 
So that is what merchant bankers do. They study your business model because if in case if you do not have an efficient business model that would hamper your revenues and that will make your life difficult because unless forget about making profits, any organization that uh, takes up a new business venture, their focus is no longer earning profits. Gone are those days when organizations used to focus on making profit. These days the focus is on survival. The focus is on generating cash, not on generating profits. And that is what most of the startups are doing, right? Uh, Flipkart has not delivered any profit so far since its inception. Amazon, which ventured into India a couple of years back, has not even delivered one rupee profit. Paytm is still under losses. They have not even delivered any profit. Swiggy has not delivered any profit. Zomato has not delivered any profit. Then you might be wondering how do these organizations, all these startups survive despite of not delivering any profit? The answer is the competition is such that that initially few years is the time period when you have to spend a lot of money to establish a business model. And that is what most of these startups do. They try to create a business model. Now, Paytm has established a very sound business model, which seems to be a lot more comprehensive in comparison with the competitors. But this not has this is not has. I mean, this model of Paytm, what you see is not being developed overnight it has taken a lot of time. So right now, what most of the startups do is they get the money through venture capitalists. They burn that cash and again they go for capital. So that's the reason I have termed their business model as cash burning model because they borrow money from the venture capitalists. They burn the cash. So you might be wondering what do you mean by burning of cash? But uh, the the term burning of cash here means spend that entire money in promotional brand building and business model building activity. When Paytm gives you a lot of cashbacks, you're more than happy to download the app. But the moment the cashback stops, you're now uh, thinking of an alternative, right? There's a difference between an Indian customer and a uh, and a customer in UK. In, in UK, customers are more loyal to brands. But here in India, we are more loyal to not brands. We are more loyal to price. Somebody who gives us a good deal, we become loyal to that brand. First few years, Paytm was giving us cashback, so we were happy to be associated with Paytm. Then comes phone pay, it started giving you cash back, then we switched over. Then came Amazon pay, we switched over. So that's the reason it becomes quite difficult in, in a country like India to do business also because people here are very price conscious and cost conscious. So how long can I can give you cash backs? So therefore, what happens is at one point in time, I feel that, okay, even if I don't get cash back, it's fine because I'm more comfortable using Paytm's platform. I'm more comfortable using the format what Paytm has developed because I have all my data saved in that, all the electric bills, all my insurance bills, all my credit card bills, all my uh, flight booking information, everything is saved. So I don't want to go and do it in a new one. So this is called uh, a concept wherein customer is not willing to switch over. And this is the stage which is generally referred to as consolidation stage in the startup world. So this is when you story slowly start eliminating all sorts of freebies, all sorts of premium what you used to give to customer. So Flipkart is in consolidation stage because when we do a year to year comparison, Flipkart losses are steeply reducing. Paytm is in consolidation stage because they are no longer giving all those freebies the way they used to give. So they are also in consolidation stage. So what will happen? This stage will continue and after a few years, these companies will start making profits. So this is their business model. So as a merchant banker, I need to study the business model to decide what is the value of your share. So I've just given you one example. So there are many other analysis which needs to be done. It's not just the business model. I have to also study what is your competitive position. In what way are you different from the competitors? In what way are you best from the rest? Right. So what is your uniqueness? What are your marketing strategies? What is the kind of product portfolio you, you have to offer to the customers? Are your products successful in the market? Right. So all this evaluation is done and all this evaluation becomes part of qualitative analysis. So it's not just the business and strategy we are evaluating. We are also evaluating the leadership 
as a part of qualitative analysis because ultimately it is the leader who can make or break the business a good leadership can take an ordinary business to a different level and we have seen this in many examples an organization which has a humble beginning but because of the transformative leadership it goes to a different level and we have also seen examples of what happens when the leadership is absolutely uh, disastrous right we saw in the example of kingfisher what happened when there's no good organization right so these are the things that uh, the merchant bankers do uh, evaluate now on the other hand in quantitative analysis it's more of your financial data that gets scrutinized so your earning per share your price earning ratio your liquidity ratios your solvency ratios uh, your cash flows all this gets ratified and it also gets compared with the industry with the peers so merchant bankers do all this evaluation and they come finally to a conclusion stating that okay we have done all the assessment and the share price of your company is only worth so much and this price now after in discussion with the company gets communicated to the public and when the moment the share price is released it is announced all the brokerage firms will do their own review they will say okay the the price is fairly decided the price is rightly decided or sometimes in case if it is not done then they will easily say that it's overpriced so the moment the price is right uh, kept at a higher levels without any proper evaluation what will happen there will be a very poor response to the ipo right we have seen a lot of examples of uh, a share price not being uh, uh, priced correctly and there was a very terrible response to the ipo right so there are cases like this so that's that's the reason merchant bankers due diligence plays an important role in deciding the share prices now once the due diligence is done by the merchant banker which is the first step which is the first step the second step is to prepare the budget that means in order to procure the funds from the public also there are so many expenses because you have to involve so many parties you have to involve chartered accountants lawyers bankers brokers right so you have to pay them right so there's a lot of money involved in uh, issuing shares and borrowing money from the public so this budget needs to be prepared by the merchant banker so he should tell the company that this is the expense which the company has to incur in borrowing the funds so that's the next task the third task is to suggest the timing of the issue which according to me is a very crucial decision because if the timing of the issue if it goes wrong then the entire uh, issue is in serious trouble right you can't ask a company to go for an ipo when the entire country is under lockdown when there is a serious crisis when there is mass unemployment when there is migration crisis when people don't have money at their disposal at their disposal then you can't ask companies much i i as a merchant banker can't tell the company to go ahead and issue share and that's the reason why you uh, didn't see any ipo during the last 6 months and in the last 2 months we have uh, new ipos coming up after the economies has opened up so when we say timing of the issue don't think timing of the issue has to do something with astrology when we say timing of the issue it is more in terms of the uh, economic perspective whether the economy is uh, going through a proper uh, business cycle and if it is going through a proper business cycle then that's the time when you come up with an ipo now considering the fact that uh, we are having uh, turbulent times on account of pandemic but we also cannot deny the fact that even though the macroeconomic indicators are terribly bad but there's a lot of liquidity in the market so sometimes uh, you might be wondering india's gdp is at a negative rate in india there is mass unemployment right government policies have completely paralyzed the economy but despite of this why why share market doing so well you might be uh, pondering on this question now the answer to this question is the liquidity liquidity means availability of cash now i have a lot of cash with me what what do i do with that so i invest in government bonds the answer is government hardly has any money to pay interest because government revenue is totally hit on account of pandemic so government has reduced the interest rate on all its bonds 
So investing in government bonds is not a good option. So where do I invest? Gold. Okay. Now gold and stock market always go hand in glove. That means there is no, uh, they don't go in the same direction. They go in opposite direction. So during pandemic, initially in the first four months, when stock market crashed, gold seems to be the only option for the investors to park their money. And that's one of the reasons why gold did extremely well. So gold glittered during the first four months of pandemic. But as the markets reopened, as the economies uh, decided to reopen, uh, unlock the lockdown, slowly we saw an opposite trend. That means all the money which was parked in the gold now started uh, getting disappeared. And from there, the money was channelized in the stock market. So the reason why the stock markets are doing well, it's not because we have good economic situation, right? There's no, at the moment, there's no correlation between the econ condition of the economy and the stock market performance because both are going in opposite direction. Economy is not doing well, but the stock markets are doing well. And the reason for this is a liquidity, is the availability of cash, reason number one. And second, lack of options. Gold is doing bad. Government bonds are doing bad. Interest rates are all time low. So where do I park my money? So let me put all my money into the stock markets. And you know that in India, we have uh, investors like me and you who follow herd mentality. Right? So somebody will tell you, hey, Macha, invest in the stock market. It's doing well. Blindly you invest without doing an assessment. Right? I always remember the quote of uh, uh, the investment guru, Warren Buffett, who says that you should be greedy when others are fearful. And you should be fearful when others are greedy. Such a nice quote, which basically tells that when the stock markets have crashed, when there is a downtrend in the stock market, that is when you have to enter the stock market. And when the stock markets are doing extremely well, that is when you have to be fearful and be cautious. That's the advice. And this is the advice uh, which people with uh, rational decision making follow. Otherwise, people by and large in India follow the herd mentality. Now the stock markets are doing well, so let me invest. What has happened now? Uh, Irrational optimism is giving the uh, stock market a push now, right? Market is rising all, all the way down. Most of the shares are overvalued, right? And all the analysts are scared that the way the stock market is progressing at one point in time, it may again crash. Yeah. So you have to exercise caution at this stage of time. So timing is very important. When to issue shares plays an important role. So that suggestion should also be given by the merchant bank. So merchant bankers should suggest the issuing company when to open the issue to the public. And then comes preparation and designing of the offer document. In other words, it is also called as prospectors, which I said that it contains all the comprehensive information. Now, one point which is worth noting here, and I wanted to ask you, right? Uh, so just give the answer in your mind because you won't be able to answer me or you can probably put it in the chat box. If there is any misinformation in the prospectus if there is any misleading information in the prospectus who do you think will be held responsible for this is it the merchant banker or is it the issuing company there is an information which is false who should be held responsible for this now because merchant banker is the one who prepares the prospectus so it is his responsibility. So one of the pre-issue task of merchant banker is to prepare the prospectus, is to design the prospectus. So answer to this question is merchant bankers are very smart because after preparing the prospectus, they will give a disclaimer stating that the entire prospectus has been prepared with the help of information which is supplied by the company. And they've taken all the possible measures to ensure that they have Check the information, but ultimately the liability lies on the shoulders of the company. So if there is any misrepresentation, company is responsible, not the merchant bankers. Right? It is similar to what auditors do. Right? They will do auditing of all the books of accounts, but they don't claim the responsibility if there is any anomaly because at the end of the day, auditing is done by uh, auditors based on the information supplied to company. So obviously, companies can manipulate. But in some cases, auditors are also involved. So yes, this is a very, uh, uh, I would say critical task of ensuring that the information provided in the information brochure is absolutely accurate.
So once the information brochure uh, or the offer document is prepared and designed by the merchant banker, the next step is to advise the company on appointment of other important intermediaries like registrar, underwriters, brokers, bankers, and advertising agencies, right? And the last step is to ensure that the uh, compliance, which is being uh, uh, formulated by SEBI, is properly followed by the uh, merchant bankers. So the compliance part is again taken care by the merchant bankers. So these are some of the uh, pre-issue responsibilities which are performed by the uh, merchant bankers. And once the shares are issued, uh, then they also have post uh, issue responsibilities. So let's see uh, what are the uh, post issue responsibilities that merchant bankers should undertake. So the post issue responsibility includes uh, managing uh, the escrow account. So escrow account is an, is an account where all the funds collected from the investors are parked. And later, the escrow account is closed by handing over the money to the issuing company. Allotment of shares and people who don't get shares, the money needs to be refunded. So not everybody gets a share, especially when there is oversubscription, not everybody gets a share, right? For every, let's say there is 100 shares with the company is planning to issue. If 1,000 people apply, the chances of getting shares for all the 1,000 people is absolutely not possible. Right? So people who don't get shares, the money needs to be refunded. So that, or that task is also uh, given to the merchant bankers. And in case if the shares are allotted, allotment uh, message needs to be sent to the investor and money is deducted from the bank account. So once the shares are allotted, the next major task is the finalization of trading, which means the entire primary market process is over. Now the shares is about to get listed in recognized stock exchanges where they will be publicly available for trading between the investors, right? And all those shares are converted into electronic entries. So no longer uh, share certificates exist. Everything is dematerialized. And the records of all the shares which are issued in the stock market, which are bought and sold on a daily basis needs to be maintained by another financial uh, institution called depositories. So depositories are the financial institutions who maintain the records of all the shares in electronic form. They are the institution which is <coughs> responsible for dematerialization, right? Imagine uh, there is a meeting invitation to attend a board of uh, directors or, a, or, a, an, or an annual general body meeting. Anybody can attend, any shareholder can attend the annual general body meeting. Even if you have one share also, you are entitled to attend annual general body meeting. So that's the chance what you get. Right? You get the opportunity to attend the uh, annual general body meeting. So what happened a couple of years back when uh, I was a student like you, uh, I had invested some 8,000 or 6,000 in the shares when I was doing my graduation. So at that point in time, uh, I got an invitation. I got an invitation from Wipro to attend the annual general body meeting in its headquarters in, uh, I think it's on Sarjapur Road, right? So there uh, I got an invitation. So I was quite excited. Uh, I was feeling as if I am the owner of the company by looking at the invitation. That, that was the kind of words that were used in the uh, invitation. I think I hardly had two or three shares of people at that point in time. So I just wanted to know what happens in this AGM. So I visited the office. Now, how will the people there in Wipro will come to know whether I am their shareholders or not? Whether I am the shareholder or not? What is the proof? I don't have a share certificate because the concept of share, <coughs> excuse me, the concept of share certificate has totally disappeared because now everything is dematerialized. <coughs> so the answer to this question is, how will they evaluate whether I'm a shareholder or not? And given the fact that every second shares changes hand, that means the moment I sell the share at uh, five, two, two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, two o'clock, second, second, right? Two, two o'clock and two seconds, the share might be in somebody else's account. So he will become the shareholder. So every second, the ownership changes. So how will they keep a track as to who's the owner of the shares which we have issued? 
So the answer to this question is again what I mentioned, the depositories, right? In India, we have two important depositories. One is the NSDL, National Securities Depository Limited. The other one is CDSL, Central Depository Securities Limited. <coughs> Excuse me. So NSDL and CDSL are the two major depositories in India who are responsible of keeping the records of all the shares that gets transacted on all the stock exchanges in India. So the moment you open a share trading account with any broker, he will give you a DPID. Remember DP, DP means Depository Participant ID. So that Depository Participant ID is given to you. And that is the ID in which, that is the ID in, that's kind of an account, DP account. So the, the username is the DP ID. So DP account is the account where all your shares are electronically held. All your shares are dematerialized. They are converted into physical document into electronic entries and they are electronically stored in an account called DP account. And this DP account is opened by your stockbroker and who ma maintains the DP account? The DP account is maintained by the depositories which I was talking about. So what happens is the moment I go to Wipro's AGM annual general body meeting in the entrance, they will ask me, give me your DP ID. Right? So the moment I give the DP ID, they will verify whether I am the shareholder or not. So if I tell my name and if the shares are not my name, that means I'm no longer the owner of this company. So the point here is there are institutions like these depositories, uh, which maintains uh, because depositories are also one of the topic in your syllabus. So that's the reason I thought, let me uh, have some discussion on this. So depository participants maintain the records. So one of the steps is to dematerialize post issue responsibilities, dematerialization. And in case if people have any grievances, if investors have any grievances, merchant bankers should also ensure that they address the grievances of the investors. Right? So these are their post and pre-issue responsibilities. So let me quickly do a recap. Pre-issue responsibilities includes due diligence, preparation of budget, suggesting timing of issue, preparing and designing of a document, appointing key intermediaries like registrar, underwriters, brokers and bankers, and also advertising agencies, and following the compliance. These are some pre-issue responsibilities of merchant bankers. Post issue responsibilities includes management of escrow account where all the money collected from the investors is kept. Allotment of shares and also processing refund for those people who do not get shares. Finalization of trading, dispatch and dematerialization. And finally, uh, addressing the uh, concerns of the investors in case if they have any grievance. So that needs to be uh, sorted out. So these are some of the uh, pre-issue uh, responsibilities and post-issue uh, responsibilities.